Hello, I'm Arto Santala from Solita, and this is your brain on Java. I've been working in IT in various customer projects for a very long time, and uh, during that time I've used various different technologies to solve customer problems. That's my, my typical day at work is uh, figuring out what problems need to be solved and then figuring out what technologies and tools will help me do that. Uh, I cannot say that I've ever worked with brains before, so this will be interesting for me as well. Uh, obviously, what I'm going to now go through in the next 30 minutes time, uh, this is not from any, any real ongoing customer project right now, so this is purely my own hobby. I haven't studied brains in university at all, uh, so everything I'm going to go through on that side is going to be based on what I have picked up uh, due to this interest of mine. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate much more on the technical side of things, so hopefully that will be interesting for you. Why brains? Well, I think the high-level reason for why I'm interested in brains is uh, user interfaces. So on the left side you can see kind of traditional user interfaces, keyboards. Keyboards uh, are very widely used today to control machines and processes and services around us. And, uh, and uh, I think we have, we have acc accustomed ourselves a lot around the keyboard, so they, they are easy to use. Uh, however, uh, interesting enough uh, is that the layout of the keyboard is from ancient times. It's supposed to not, not get your uh, letters cluttered when you are typing really fast. So, uh, technically, this user input device is supposed to make you slower. It's designed to make you slower. Uh, although we are quite fast with it th these days, it's like we, we have grown to the keyboards. My three-year-old child, however, uh, she's not so much accustomed to keyboards, she's into touch devices. So, uh, she's ac actually uh, learned so much about the controlling things with touch that she's trying to swipe children's programs when there's uh, something she doesn't like, she tries to swipe it away or tap the one she likes. So uh, touch interfaces are everywhere and we are using them almost equally to control things these days, even though they might not always be optimal. But both are widely kind of uh, wi widely uh, successful and widely used uh, ways to control the world around us. Then we have some wilder things, like we have uh, audio-based devices, um, I actually used them quite a lot when I became father. Um, I noticed that I always have my hands full with something, so it became quite convenient to control things like lighting and music around me with audio. Then we have a virtual reality and augmented reality, interesting and fascinating areas of user interfaces as well, because you, uh, you can quite naturally just uh, turn your head to see, see more or pick up things. I'm actually hoping that one day we can code in virtual reality so that I would get more exercise instead of sitting by the keyboard all day. I would be swiping things and moving in the VR. Well, that day is not yet, but a very fascinating field of study anyway. On the right side you can see a leap motion device. I have one of those and it's it's been a kind of... I've been doing some projects or studies with it as well. Uh, leap motion lets you gesture in the air and it's able to very precisely capture your fingers and gestures and, and how your hands are moving. So you can do very interesting user interfaces with that as well. Especially in the year of great pandemic, uh, would be nice to have more options to, to avoid touching surfaces. So if you were instead able to control things with your voice, or from the virtual reality without not being present, or, uh, or just using gestures, or your brain. So at the upper top corner you can see MindWave headset, which I'm wearing right now. I have an old model. Uh, there's actually a rubber band around it. Uh, it's well worn, but it's still functional and simple enough for my purposes. So I think you get the point why I'm interested on the right side. I'm not looking for things to replace, keyboard necessarily, but more like enhance and supplement it. So there are different uh, places where it might be convenient to, to uh, 
control things in, in a different manner than pulling out a keyboard and mouse or even touch screen. So in some cases this might be good replacement and in other cases it might be supplemental. How about if we use all these together and I'm able to use my voice and my brain power and my gestures to do things. So I think future is going this way. We will see more and more ways to interact uh, with the technical world around us. And that's fascinating for me. Another reason why I'm interested in this has more to do than just with user interfaces. So I'm also interested in measuring things. I'm a bit of hobbyist biohacker. Uh, I apply same principles as I apply for DevOps work that I do uh, for, for my personal life. So if, if there is a theory that I should change my habit somehow, I like to measure first and then make the slightest adaptation based on the theory, then measure again and see if that was beneficial change. So brain is ob obviously one area that's interesting to measure. Brain waves 101. So remember the disclaimer, I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, my understanding is fairly simple, so I try to keep my explanation simple as well. But I think we all know that brain waves are, are electricity. So there's impulses going in your brain. Uh, and then where there's electricity, you can measure it. So if we are measuring if there's electricity or if there's no electricity, that's not going to give us much information. It's simply, is there any activity in the brain or not? And hopefully we all have some activity going on there. Um, but if you are able to measure it more precisely and then you are able to see different bandwidths of, that, of those impulses, then uh, you can understand a little bit more what's going on. And obviously if you have more powerful devices, more powerful headsets than what I'm wearing right now, you will get more data and more finest and more, more, right, more kind of correct data. So this is mainly for my studies. It's not a scientific device, it's a commercial device. I know there are studies going on, but <clears throat> not being Elon Musk, uh, my, my uh, kind of hobby time and budget is limited. So I, I got started with this and it's been enough for me until now. Okay, so if you are able to interpret the, uh, the, the, those electric signals, the brain waves a bit more and see the bandwidths, then you are able to see different uh, states of mind. Uh, for example, uh, are you in very active engaging complex uh, state of mind are you very relaxed almost asleep uh, we are able to even capture some emotional state or if you want to interpret those brain waves you might see variations implying let's say need to rest a little bit or good recovery or something like that and if we go onwards with this very simplistic interpretation of how the brain waves work we have a uh, lower and higher frequencies so lower typically uh, equate with uh, uh, moving slower not being so active being half asleep or uh, in dreamy meditative state in the kind of high and lower brain waves and then we have the high higher frequency brain waves and they tend to indicate being active and engaging and being hyper alert and very focused, concentrated, solving something right now. If you have a brain computer interface like I do right now, you're able to measure all that. So then if we go into a bit more detail, we can see the different areas that we can individually measure. And now here is where uh, the theories vary a little bit. The bandwidth uh, splits are not kind of exact. So here is one listing. Delta waves are the slowest ones, they equate with sleep. Then we have theta waves with tired, alpha waves with kind of relaxed void state, ready to move to any direction. And then when you are really being active, you get beta waves. And then at the top we have gamma, which is an interesting area. I'll come to that shortly. So if you are measuring activity in the delta waves, bandwidth, uh, that would be your deepest meditation and dreamless sleep. So uh, typically you wouldn't get activation in this area while being awake. Deep dreamless sleep, non-REM sleep and being unconscious are typically uh, what activates this area. But also note that healing and regeneration happen during these phases. So if you were able to measure activation, you would know that this is the moment when you are recovering 
when when you are releasing muscle growth hormones etc so healing process uh, recovery is also associated with this uh, area then we have theta waves uh, theta waves are most often in sleep but also uh, when you go to deep meditation state so dreaming deep meditation daydreaming also intuitiveness being creative recalling memories having some vivid daydreams uh, those are equated by activation in this area. Then we have alpha. As I mentioned, alpha is uh, you are widely awake, but you are relaxed. You are not drowsy, so you are not falling asleep, but you are not yet being very active. So this is a kind of tranquil conscious state. Um, when you take a break from, from conference and you walk around a little bit, you are in alpha state. If you if you reflect or meditate actively you will will be in alpha state so it's a bit more active than the previous ones beta as i said is your typical kind of working on something uh, you can separate that to low beta mid range and then high beta to find nuances but uh, you will be when beta area activates uh, you will be typically active so your active conversation decision making problem solving focusing on a task, uh, learning new concepts, debating, or like I'm doing right now, delivering a presentation. So you have to be present and active. You are using your brain actively. And then finally, this is another interesting area, gamma waves. So fastest of brain waves, uh, these relate to simultaneous processing of information. In other words, multitasking. But also you can say that this is uh, uh, consciousness, greater presence uh, might be higher state of consciousness altruism universal love so very interesting area this was dismissed as spare brain noise for some time until it was figured out what activates this area so okay so if you wanted to have some really creative guys working for you if you slap a headset on to on their everybody's head then you can measure when they are in the optimal state so I think gamma wave area would be for theologists and, and cultists. So if you want a cult following, get a thousand headsets and uh, use those to uh, use that feedback loop to make sure that they stay in the gamma range. And then if you wanted some great designers, I think uh, you would go either theta or alpha waves. That's very creative area. And then if you want hard practical workers, make them stay in the beta wave. So that was obviously a joke. Mm. I'm not an evil over overlord, even though I have jokes like that. But uh, I did a study, so I actually took my headset and uh, connected that to AWS Kinesis Streams. Because I see this headset as another IoT device. Similarly, then I, uh, I, can, I can, in my work days, I can measure some, uh, some kind of sensor packages or technical equipment moving or going from different uh, across different states or te temperature changing or whatever you like to monitor uh, I, I could connect tens of thousands or even millions of devices like that well this is another iot device it's providing data uh, i'm able to grab that put it to kinesis stream then use kinesis analytics and uh, make some kind of uh, insights based on the data store it to other uh, serverless services so that was a fun demo but I only did it on one one headset and uh, I don't think any 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 place uh, would, would let you actually grab that data because that's high, highly GDPR sensitive if you're kind of reading and storing people's brains another disclaimer is that this is not as simple as I as I just went through um, all the brain bandwidth areas work in, in kind of cooperation. So you're not activating just one, you're typically activating multiple ones. So this is actually where it gets really interesting to interpret these activations. And then you will typically be varying quite a lot. So you are not in a, what, just one state and maintaining that. Um, if you work on the averages, average might be something on one area and that might tell you something but you will be fluctuating from one state to another constantly no matter what you do so uh, these uh, projects and products 
Uh, actually, this NeuroSky MindWave has been used to, to some interesting things. USA Olympic ar archery team was interested in improving their game, game skills. Mainly that would be focus, so you are able to focus or relax and meditate. So they slapped the headsets on and did some measuring and got that feedback loop going. It's actually possible to train your brain to, to reach the meditation state or reach your kind of uh, focus and high energy active state uh, better and faster. Uh, you can reach these goals uh, after just a short while of exercise on this. And then, then there's some other things like a lot of toys, obviously. I got introduced to this via a toy. And then, uh, then there's um, some devices that let you control real world things. Uh, I, I have a link list at the end of this, but there's, uh, for example, wheelchairs being uh, controlled by, by your brain waves. And then there's, I've seen drones controlled, although that's a scary, scary combination. And you can control hands, so you can have a mechanical hand and use your just brain waves to control that. Actually, the demonstration was done, done so that you are controlling somebody else's mechanical hand. So many things come possible. As I said, my interest here is uh, technical and it uh, tends to lead to uh, using programming languages to do this. So I have been experimenting with Kotlin and Java uh, and I ended up with Python because I've been using Python a lot recently and it's flexible and easy kind of for, for easy, easy things. So I'm going to introduce some, some kind of demos and insights here, some code examples as well like the one you see here. Everything is available right now in the GitHub. So if you are interested in what I'm going to show to you, if you would like to play with these a little bit, just go to github slash crystal slash project illithid and you are able to pull all the code I'm going to show. With the exception that I'm not open sourcing my brainwave recordings, so those I consider private. You have to unfortunately get the headset and do your own if you like to study them. Uh, okay, so I have some code examples. They look a little bit like this, so here uh, I'm actually uh, creating, I mean, I'm using a library, MindWave library, and uh, interesting thing is that I went through a lot of them when I tried to find a good one that works for me. But I ended up uh, one with that works by serial port because that seemed straightforward and simple for me, most reliable. Unfortunately, many of those were kind of uh, abandoned and they were uh, written in Python 2. So I actually ended up creating my own library that's included in the project. Feel free to use it as you like. It's uh, slightly inspired by the existing ones, but it's an improved model that works on Python version 3. It's fairly simple. Uh, so you, you create a headset based on uh, the serial port that you want to use to connect. And then you can access the values, you can access some events mainly yeah sorry you cannot control brain through this this is read only yeah but you can access the raw values you can access the interpreted values different bandwidth activations and you can access values for attention and meditation which are interpreted already by the headset if you like then i have another tool which is able to record these things to a csv file like this so uh, I'm able to do 10 minute recordings uh, of me doing various things and then I'm able to record them and use some data science tools to analyze that uh, how, how I like to do. So it's possible for me to compare things like uh, how, do the, how does the brain act when I'm doing different things, hence the name of the presentation. How does your brain look on Java? How does it look on Python? How does it look when you are just relaxing and doing something else? So it's possible to compare these. And uh, then it's also possible to compare different bandwidth areas. You can say, uh, does this activate theta or beta more? How does it go? There are some utilities to normalize things uh, and, and uh, make them uh, make the scale same, comparable, and make the time, time range to be starting from the same moment. So these might be useful if you get interested and want to do some comparisons. So here is some uh, graphs that I have done in, in uh, Jupyter Notebook. 
there's YouTube, Slack and Python coding and we are comparing theta bandwidth. Note that these are not normalized so Python uh, scale is highest and Slack is lo uh, lowest. There are some spikes as you can see so to be able to, to measure these better you might want to uh, again as is usual you want, might want to remove some outliers before going into it. Also notice that when I started watching YouTube it looked different in the beginning possibly because what you have been doing just before is still affecting. Also possible that if you start an activity uh, your mind might be in different state but it not, tends to normalize after a bit of bit of time and then you're able to see some differences. So in this case as you can see uh, brainwaves look quite the same so spiky going up and down all the time but uh, I would say that theta activated most when doing Python and then on, on the average uh, there was most activation highest activation and then Slack and YouTube were not as activating. Now remember that theta is not active state so interesting finding is that I was actually in pretty much meditative relaxed state when doing Python. It was more, more kind of relaxed than chatting in Slack and watching YouTube. Interesting finding. Yeah, as I said, there's links uh, in the presentation. Presentation will be available in SlideShare, but I think we have reached the point when it's demo time. Okay, so hopefully theory was interesting. Let's see how I cope with the demonstrations. Okay. Demonstration number one. Here is my project from GitHub. So I have few different parts here. I'm first going to show you what I can do with my mind reader part. Mind reader is a recorder. So recorder tool is uh, letting me record my brainwaves and put them to a CSV file. Let's try if I can make that run. So Python as I said, Python 3 required, uh, you also need some dependencies, but there's readme files if you want to play with this. Uh, mainly it's serial library for, for the MindWave only. So let's try something. Uh, delivering presentation. Yeah, it's adding timestamp and extension. Uh, MindWave takes a little bit of time to start, so don't worry if it's not getting readings, I'm not a zombie, hopefully uh, it should kind of spin up after a while. Uh, I'm being lucky right now, I think the electrodes are set up really good because I'm immediately getting attention and meditation numbers and different bandwidth waves. So all that information is stored into a CSV file and if I take that file, open it it's now stored so I'm able to spend as much time as I need and I'm able to do some comparisons with these. So speaking of which another fun tool that I have here provided if you want to play with it. Well it's not Jupyter Lab that's common commonly used Python model module when you want to do some insight into data and it works for any IoT data so why not for the brain. Let's see, it should start soon. Unless I have screwed up my machine. Yeah, it's just taking a bit of time. Okay, so I have few uh, Jupyter notebooks in the project. Uh, not the data, as I said, but the notebooks are here. So first of all, I have project deleted notebook. Uh, first step is to install some of the dependencies. I have done that already. Second step is a little bit of code. So first bit load different recordings. So there's a recording of me watching TV. That was fun to do. Then I have recording, watching YouTube, uh, gaming, playing computer games, chatting, coding Python and coding Java. So those are my samples. Each one is 10 minutes, so it's normalized to be the same. Then I have some utilities to, to kind of, as I said, uh, uh, set the scale to be the same, both time-wise and, and uh, the uh, 
kind of the scale of the values can be normalized so that I can graph them in a, in a comparable way. Then I have the actual logic here, so I'm able to read different areas like high beta, which should be activation. And let's run this and see what happens. It takes a bit of time and then it crunches through the CSV. So watching TV, uh, it seems like there was some activation going on in the beginning might have been more interesting or I, I was still engaged with previous activity but then it went to a bit uh, lower levels the scale is same in all of the, these so these are now comparable then I have uh, watching YouTube it was quite similar but there's a bit more spikes perhaps so it seems like there was some interesting moments when I was more engaged and processing something I would expect that typically when watching television it's not that much processing, it's kind of a very lazy format. When you do something interactive um, or you are studying something, you would expect that you engage a bit more. Then we have computer gaming and as we would expect, it seems like there's not so much spikes, but the average level seems to roughly go up a bit more. So perhaps more present there. And chatting in Slack has combination of spikes and higher average level. And then when I do Python coding, I really crack, crack the brain waves. So now I'm being very active. Oddly enough, when coding Java, I start out active, but then it goes down to almost television levels. Well, my best theory for this is that I've coded Java for pretty much 25 years. So I don't really need to think about or look anything up. So I'm just writing the code pretty much. Even though Java has uh, gone onwards, it's been quite easy to keep up with latest Java 15 and 16 versions. So it's not activating my brain that much anymore. At least that's what the data tells me. However, Python, well, uh, I've been only doing Python for a few years. Uh, uh, miraculously, I've been able to avoid it until now. I've been doing a lot of data science work recently with Python. So I still need to look up many things and I still need to remember uh, how some, some of the things are done. So I don't know why, but it seems like my brain is activated uh, in high beta area, the active area, the most when I do Python coding. If I wanted to activate my brain, it seems like some, some fun thing to do. And if I wanted to relax my brain, well, not activate my brain, I should code Java. It seems like I'm activating even less than with watching television. So I think that was fun stuff. Okay. I have another uh, notebook, which might be even more interesting. So let's grab real time notebook. And the name is already spoiling what I'm going to do. So let's start it. What if I hook my data analysis tools and uh, hook them real time to this IoT device, which is my brain? So what if, if I'm graphing my attention and meditation levels real time in, in a graph? It seems like my attention is really, really high right now. So I'm actually able to see what different things affect here. Uh, if it were allowed, this would be a fun tool for the work interviews, but fear not. <laughs> I don't think we are allowed to even think about putting, putting a potential interviewee to brain scan <laughs> sounds like uh, sounds like not not ethical. However, I'm hooked to this right now, so let's see if I'm able to actually get some feedback loop going. So, am am I able to? Well, my meditation is quite high, but my attention is average. So, am I able to concentrate? What happens if I concentrate a bit more? Let's let's see. Okay, I was not able to concentrate quite a lot. My brain is having a hard time concentrating. For some reason, I've always been able to, to meditate much better. However, you might have seen some rise there when I tried to concentrate. My trick for concentration is to try and do some mathematical calculations, 
let's uh, they were summarized let's see let's try again to see if that was a random noise or if I was able to move that a little bit let's let's try Yeah, it's hard to keep the concentration up, for me at least, but as you can see I can affect it a little bit. If I concentrate a little bit I can move it upwards. Uh, also probably worth noting is that meditation sometimes rises at the same time, so these are not at the opposite ends of the scale. It's theoretically possible to meditate and concentrate at the same time, although not, not very easy. Uh, theoretically possible to not do either one of those at all at the same time. I think I should have better luck with meditation. Let's try because I've been doing it due to my hobbies. So so if I'm able to clear my mind, let's see. Yeah, we got to 100 quite quite rapidly and then I would be able to maintain it there for longer. So for me, meditation, emptying mind is somehow easy. Uh, concentration, focus, I can do it, but it's a bit spiky. It's very especially difficult to maintain it. Okay, I hope that was interesting for you. So real-time plotting, already interesting thing for any IoT device, but real-time plotting of my brain and being able to see that real-time and see what thi how things are affecting it. I think that's interesting stuff. So, because time is limited, I think it's time to go for our third and last demonstration. And uh, because I was not able to concentrate very well with that one, well, let's hope I do better because this next and final demo is based on concentration. So, if I'm not able to do that, this will be really quick and uh, boring demo. Let's see. So my last demo is about hue control. What I have done is I have connected uh, uh, this headset to my laptop. So I'm reading it uh, with Python. But I have another library which is uh, Philips Hue lights. So I'm able to I'm able to control the lights by code. And when I combine both of these, I should be able to control lights with my mind. Let's see how I do. Uh, yeah, this requires concentration, so I will probably be quiet for a bit to be able to try and concentrate. Let's see how, how this works. It seems I have I made some last minute changes, so I hope that's not going to break this. Yeah, it's not going to break. It's working. So... Uh, I'm trying to concentrate. If I'm able to concentrate, we should see some intensity. Let's see how that works. Yeah, I think that's it. So we got a nice, bl uh, nice blue hue, and uh, now that it's blinking, it's actually telling me that maximum intensity has been reached. I made this easier for my brain. If I was really evil, I would have made this a game. So if you are not concentrating, it would lower, and if you are concentrating, it would go higher. But as you, as you know, that's not my strong point. I should do it with meditation instead. Uh, problem with meditation is that if you see the results you get excited and then you drop the meditation at that point. But that was my demo and I'm glad that it worked. I need to fix a few lines of code in the beginning that I tried uh, mainly to uh, how to reset the lamp. But the code in GitHub doesn't have those. It should be all working. So these APIs are really not rocket or dare I say brain science. Uh, API for the mind wave is very very simple as you can see 
API for the hue lamps very very simple. I was able to affect the real world around me just by concentrating. I didn't need to touch anything. Um, you could say it was quite a lot of effort to turn the lamp on. Uh, there are easier ways to do that. But as I said, this is not for kind of benefit right now. This is just for my own amusement. As a tech nerd, this amuses me. And as a biohacker, um, it's fairly interesting for me to understand a bit more how my brain works and possibly even train it. I think I have been missing my attention days, so I should probably be training my attention to be much better. Okay, so hopefully this presentation was interesting and educational for you. Remember that all the code is available in GitHub. You can grab it, you can, you can uh, build on top of that. If you do, please let me know, because uh, we are always doing a little bit of crazy prototype projects like this in Solita, but I would really love to, to know what kind of ideas you got from this. And if, if you built successfully something on top of this that's geeky as this is, well, I, I would be uh, delighted to know. And uh, I think this was it. Stay tuned for our dev blogs and for our new YouTube channel. Solitatech, uh, Solitatech brand because there will be uh, some more crazy stuff and less crazy stuff coming up. So all, all kinds of technical geekery is going on. Thanks for listening. Hope you were ent entertained and learned something new. Bye bye.